Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very, very special video for you guys because this is going to be a full review on one of my favorite Amouage fragrances of all time. And if you've been following the channel, you know a couple things about me. Well, you know a lot about me because I'm actually very open. Uh, I have very few secrets, but one thing that you'll have noticed over the last 18 months or so of my channel being up is that I've been doing a lot of early impression videos where I, you know, talk about a fragrance and, and I do go into pretty good depth to be fair, but uh, like recently I reviewed uh, Fior de Ombre by um, Perfume Roma, okay? And it was off of a decant, very kindly sent to me by Nick, but I don't own that bottle, you know, and the reason I was doing that, sort of my thought process, is I figured, you know what, I'll always have these bottles of fragrances to review. That was sort of what I was thinking. Well, uh, if you've been following my channel, you know that may not be true. I may end up losing some of these bottles of fragrances. And so my theory was flawed because I just assumed I would always have my bottles to do a full review on. So I'm going to try to knock out as many full reviews as I can, while I can, on some of my all-time favorite fragrances because the whole point of this channel was to share my love and passion of perfumery with you guys. And some of the fragrances I'm most passionate about, I've never done reviews on. And so I'm gonna try, obviously I won't be able to change all of it. I have whatever it is, 800 fragrances or 700 or whatever it is. Um, and many of the full, many, many of the full bottles is that I've never reviewed. I've never reviewed many of the full bottles because I've just been sort of waiting and I figured I had all the time in the world. So today we're going to review the great, epic, Man by Emwage. Basically, one of the greatest fragrances that Emwage has ever come out with, in my opinion. A Hall of Fame fragrance, if there was one. And um, I'm going to give you my thoughts, but uh, here's the thing. There's many reviews of Epic Man on YouTube. So if you would like to just go sort of, I guess, see um, what some people say about the notes and this and that, you know, you can. I'm going to tell, tell you the imagery that I see with this fragrance because... With Epic, it's one of the fragrances in my collection. If you've seen some of my other reviews uh, where I really go into detail, if I ever find a fragrance that just really moves me many times, like an image and a story comes to my head instantly. And that is exactly what Epic does for me. So the very first thing I have to say about Epic is that this is a mysterious and a magical perfume to me. Now, this bottle, you can see the dent I've put in it. I don't know if you can see the, the juice, but uh, I've put a pretty respectable dent in this bottle. I've had this maybe, I want to say five or six years. Um, actually, no, it must have been six or seven because I actually bought this um, before I ended up getting married. So this is one of my older bottles of fragrance. Uh, you can see it doesn't say Epic anywhere on it. There's no Epic written on it. Uh, some of the Epic bottles will actually say it on the side right here. Some of them will say it uh, down below. The new version of Epic actually says it down below. And I'm not going to get into the rumors of the new one being weaker, but there are rumors out there about the newer version of Epic that has it written right here being weaker and different and not as strong. This is a 15-hour fragrance on my skin. I mean, it literally lasts forever. It is a beast. That's the first thing to get out of the way. However, again, this is a bottle. It's not a snap cap, okay? It's actually a magnetic cap, but it's one of the older magnetic caps where it still has the writing on the collar. So if you can find this, or if you can find the old snap cap before they went to the magnetic caps, I would say do that. But I've had very good luck with my magnetic caps as long as you stick with the ones that don't say the name here. If it says it on the side... On the collar, that's perfectly fine. That would be my advice. If you can find an older bottle, go for that. Okay, so with that out of the way, and the fact that you know that this is a mysterious perfume, the first thing people always ask because of the bottle is, is this a green fragrance? That's the very first thing that comes to mind. Is Epic a green perfume? And when you think of green fragrances, a lot of people are thinking about something like you know, Chanel number 19, you know, or something like that with a lot of geranium and um, with a lot of um, galbanum and, you know, these kind of green notes. And there are green notes in here, but it's nothing like the green fragrances you're thinking of. So if you're thinking of Chanel number 19, if you're thinking of something like this, Estee Lauder's Private Collection, one of the greatest green fragrances from the 70s. If you're thinking about Frederick Mall's Synthetic Jungle, you're completely off the beaten path, okay? That is, um, there's no comparison for me. 
between the green fragrances that they used to do in uh, fine French perfumery and this. So I would say the, the answer to that question is yes, it is a green fragrance, but it is a green incense fragrance. It's a green Arabic style incense fragrance if you want to nail it down even further. And so this green incense fragrance, I would say go go smell something like Tom Ford's green incense, which is verb to ensemble. It's discontinued, but I have a bottle. I'll review it one day, God willing. Um, and so verb to ensemble, um, excuse me, is a fragrance that you would probably smell this and smell that and say they have nothing in common because Verte Ensemble has much more of this thicker putty, almost like resinous heliotrope thing going on and the puttiness of Verte Ensemble and, you know, just this sort of oily texture in the opening make it go in a different direction, as it should. It's a completely different fragrance, but they're both two green incense. I was going to grab the bottle and I forgot, but you've seen me show off the Verte Ensemble bottle before. I'll do a review on it, like I said, God willing, hopefully one day. Um, but that's the, um, that is the, you know, category I would put this in. Is it a green fragrance? Yes, but it's a green incense heavy fragrance. That's the first thing to mention. And, uh, like I said, it's not a great comparison, but it will get you in the ballpark. Think about Arabic style fragrances with oud and incense and think about green incense fragrances and you'll get in the ballpark. So for those of you who want sort of the cliff notes version of how I feel about Epic Man, there is a story, and I've told this story a little before, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail today. So this is the image that sort of comes to mind when I, when I spray Epic Man. I've been wearing it as my scent of the day today. I actually wore it as my scent of the day yesterday, and I planned on doing this video yesterday, but I wasn't ready. I felt like I wanted to give it just one more full wear. Even though I know this fragrance like the back of my hand, I wanted to wear this to work. I wanted to really immerse myself in it two days in a row, which I hardly ever do anymore because every day I wear a different fragrance nowadays. Um, so I've worn this two days in a row now, and I've had it, like I said, for uh, seven, eight years, however long it's been since I've had this bottle. Um, so I've, I've worn this for many, many years in many different weathers. It's actually August, and it performed beautifully here in Texas. Um, but I've worn this in the winter, and it's beautiful. This is, for me, an, an all-year-round fragrance. But most people would probably put it towards the winter side of things because it has the spices and ouds and leather and all that good stuff, which we're going to get into. So um, here's the image I want you to think about. Close your eyes and imagine that there is a caravan, okay? And this caravan is traveling from the Middle East to China or from the China or from China to the Middle East. Um, and think of the Silk Road. That's actually the imagery that Amouage wants you to think of when you think about this fragrance. Think of the Silk Road. But in my version of the story, we're going to do something a little different than Amouache's official version. So I want you to imagine the silk coming from China, and I want you to imagine the frankincense coming from the Middle East. Let's say it's actually coming from the lost city of Ubar, which Amouache has a fragrance called Ubar, which the re-release came out in 2009. I have a full review of that on my channel if you'd like to go check that out. It is a brilliant fragrance. I would love to have a bottle of that one day, although I will not be acquiring any bottles anytime soon. Um, but... Once all of this is behind me, I will start uh, buying some bottles again. So, but imagine this sort of these caravans traveling, okay? Silk from China and frankincense from the lost city of Ubar, let's say in the Middle East. And I want you to imagine on a random night, they all come together, okay? They build a giant fire pit because they're in the desert and it's probably cold, right? So the temperatures are dropping in the desert at night. And if you've never been, it you know, it probably sounds weird, but if you've never been to the Middle East, I was born in Jordan, I still have family in Jordan, um, I ended up going back, and when you're in the desert and it's cold uh, at night, it shocks you how fast the temperature can drop when the sun goes down in the desert. People are surprised by how cold it can get. It can get cold in the desert. And um, so I want you to imagine that these two caravans meet, they build a giant fire, okay, and, you know, let's say, this is fantasy, but stay with me. So imagine one of those caravans is traveling with a magician and imagine that this magician after maybe uh, consuming too much adak or smoking too much hookah, let's say they're having a good time in the middle of the night, he wants to show them something. He wants to show them a trick that he has discovered and he goes to the back of one of the camels and he mixes up a potion and in this potion, of course it's going to be a green potion, but it's made up mostly of things like spices and oud and leather 
and castorium and myrrh and saffron and all these amazing ingredients from the Middle East, right? And when he approaches his fellow travelers, he has the potion behind his back and all eyes are on him, okay? From both caravans, they're watching him as if he's about to tell a story. Instead, he pulls the potion out from behind his back and he throws it into the fire. And as soon as the potion makes contact with the fire, up come these flames, okay? And in the flames, of course, they're green flames, right? Because it was a green potion. So green flames start to emit from the fire. Everyone's shocked who's sitting around the fire as the potion almost explodes on impact, okay? And this huge green flame erupts to the sky and everyone can smell this unique blend of spices, frankincense, cumin, and animalics, okay? Picture that imagery. You're in the desert, right? And as the potion begins to move up higher into the sky, you notice it's turning into smoke, but it's also sort of, um, you know, if you ever throw like pepper or something into a fire, how it will sort of crackle. This sort of, imagine this sort of crackly spice as it's traveling away from the fire in a green imagery, okay? Keep that imagery in mind, this sort of fiery eruption of green spices in the desert. And upon the potion hitting the fire, the viewers, let's say, his friends from the caravan, they realize all of a sudden that a sandstorm has picked up because... Either the magician did something, is it a coincidence, who knows, is it just happenstance, but all of a sudden they notice they start getting some sand in their eyes, and they notice all of a sudden their throats are starting to close up, and they notice that the desert is damn dry. How's that for a, um, for a recognition right in the middle of the desert, that sand is dry, the sand is hitting them in the beards and in their face, and they're shielding their eyes, right? They're, um, um... You know, the, it almost feels like the desert is trying to swallow the travelers alive. But they realize just how dry it is because that's a very important part of this fragrance. This is a extremely dry fragrance. Um, it's, it's one of the things that I love most about this fragrance is just how bone dry it is. It really gives you this imagery of the desert. Now, uh, only the best fragrances on earth, to me, bring up this sort of imagery. So... There are very few fragrances that I will smell, and this type of story, this imagery, this almost something as real as, you know, reading it in a book, like the words are there, it's written in my brain, I can see it from smelling this. Um, very few fragrances do this to me, only the best. And for me, the spice, so I'm going to try to give you sort of a breakdown of how I smell this fragrance, however... Um, I would say that this is an extremely complex fragrance, and I don't think we could probably talk about this for two hours, and I think there are still bits and pieces where someone could come in and say, no, this is different, I smell this here. You know, some of this is obviously subjective. I'm going to try my best to describe an extremely complex fragrance to you, but here's how it basically smells to me. So the opening is one of the most unique spiced openings I've ever smelled. In, and listed in the fragrance, the spices all come together and they blend in a way I've never smelled before. I've never smelled a spicy concoction. Even if you took these ingredients and blended them together, I don't think it would end up smelling like this. So this is pink pepper, cardamom, myrtle, nutmeg, cumin, mace. Those are the spices, okay? Which you might look at that and say, well, that is sort of a unique concoction, and it sort of is. Mace is a little bit of a strange note, um, it's, it's not a note that you, uh, find very commonly used. You know, it was used in some vintage fragrances like Dunhill Edition and stuff like that. But, um, it's basically almost like this lacy outer part of the nutmeg. Um, and it has a little bit of a different smell to the nutmeg itself. But there's mace in there and, you know, this concoction just comes together. This blend, if you will, comes together to create this magical, this magical opening to me. And... On, you notice that there was pink pepper in there. Pink pepper is a very commonly used note. It's kind of like, to me, it's like there's all these crazy spices on this hand and there's pink pepper on this hand. And the crazy spices are trying to go out of their, they're trying to go out of their gourd and go everywhere and bounce off the walls. And the pink pepper is just sort of, you know, knocking it back, almost like um, playing tennis. Anytime the ball comes to the pink pepper, they knock it back. Uh, and... 
it just keeps everything a little in the box, right? It doesn't allow things to get too crazy. It is a crazy opening to some people. Some people, the cumin will actually put you off when you first spray. I don't ever remember having a problem with this fragrance, but I have heard some people say that the cumin in the opening can give them a little bit of a body odor-like smell. I've never had that problem, personally, and I don't have that problem with cumin. I'm very lucky in that regard. But just be aware, I think some people smell the cumin heavier than others, maybe because my nose is so accustomed to these kind of challenging fragrances, I almost gloss right over it. Like, I'm looking for the cumin. I want more of that cumin in the opening. It's actually a very important part of the opening because it's an animalic note right there at the top. This, this sort of uh, sweaty, old-school cumin note right there from the get-go. Um, it's, it's a stud of a note. I absolutely love it. And um, so it just creates this magical opening. And remember the dryness. So imagine Aladdin, okay? And the Cave of Wonders, right? And um, imagine the Cave of Wonders literally trying to consume them as they're leaving, right? The desert trying to swallow them up. Um, literally coming out of the ground to try to swallow up the intruders. Uh, and so just imagine this spiced opening fighting with this dryness. And then along with that spicy, dry, desert-like feel, the character of the fragrance starts to come out instantly. You'll notice a few things happening all at once. Remember, this is an amouage, and not just any amouage. This is amouage firing on all cylinders. This came out in 2009, um, and so this is right when Christopher Chong was hitting his stride with amouage, and so it's an extremely complex fragrance, like I said, but to my nose, it gives you this sort of... Um, the fragrance gives you this uh, green, slightly oily, mostly dry, but slightly oily unlit incense. And the green incense, literally, as it continues on its epic journey, it feels as if you are uh, sniffing a frankincense tear that is living its life in fast forward, okay? So you're literally smelling it go from a bud on the frankincense tree, this sort of lemony, fresh frankincense tear ripped from the tree, turned into incense, burned, and you start to smell the smoke. As the hours go by, this fragrance picks up in smokiness, okay? So the smokiness intensifies, literally right under your nose as you're smelling it. And that's one of the beauties of the fragrance is the, uh, <laughs> the incense starts off sort of um, fresh in the beginning, and it allows the spices to bloom, because I think if your nose was hit instantly with this hardcore smoky incense, it might obscure some of the beauty of the spiced opening. The spiced opening in this is mind-blowing. I mean, it will knock you for a six. It'll knock you out of your chair. Um, and also, to combat that dryness, now, as the fragrance continues to dry, it is dry, of course, like I said, but as it continues to dry, there's a little bit of more resin start to sort of uh, show themselves. They've always been there, but it's almost like, um, you know, the curtain is peeled back just a little bit, and you get a touch of this warming resinous touch from myrrh, okay? And myrrh is another very traditional Arabic-style note with frankincense, and the myrrh here basically gives off this bitter, sort of camphoraceous-like smell, and, um, that's probably a combination of the myrrh and frankincense, but the fragrance basically turns more resinous, is what I'm trying to say, as the hours go by. The spiciness slowly begins to dry. I've got a dry down right here and a fresher spray here. Oh, oh God, I love this fragrance so much. Um, so basically, what ends up happening is, is you get this bitter myrrh that adds this unbelievable warmth to an otherwise extremely dry composition. And with that myrrh, you get saffron. But this saffron is absolutely nothing like you've ever smelled in a, in a... If you're thinking rose oud saffron, I know what this smells like, you're wrong. Just like you're thinking, I know what a spicy opening perfume smells like, you're wrong. Everything in this fragrance is unique, and it truly is properly named. Everything in this fragrance is epic. Everything is big. Everything is loud. Everything is bold. Everything is... You know, you could call this potentially a beast mode fragrance, although it has none of the modern, cheaper style, you know, amber woods that you would smell. This is 2009. So, I mean, we haven't gotten to the modern amber wood um, days yet, in my opinion. But this does last a long time and it is very strong. So, as the fragrance continues to dry, 
this combo in the base starts to solidify itself, okay? So the heart of the fragrance is myrrh and geranium. The base is really where the fragrance, I would say, um, plants its flag as one of the greatest amouages of all time for me because what you end up getting, of course, more frankincense. There's frankincense in the top and there's frankincense in the base. And I think that's how it, it was a, it's able to play this trick where you get the greener frankincense in the top and the smokier frankincense in the base. There's different layers to this frankincense. Um, obviously, incense is, is one of the, the main notes here. Um, but what ends up coming out, there's basically this trio of notes that come out in the base. There is sandalwood, oud, and leather. And with that leather, you get castorium. And castorium is one of my favorite notes of all time. You guys know I love animalic notes. And, um, you know, the castorium adds this, almost like this twang on the nose. You know, whenever you smell something and it gives you this almost like tickle, like this twang, um, it can also be slightly metallic, but uh, I love the animalic, dirty side of leather, and the castorium here delivers that. It is a brilliant castorium executed note. The quality of the ingredients is out of this world, and then you're hit with that oud. And the oud in the base, I will say this about this oud, it's not going to smell like an Ensar oud, it's not going to smell like an Ariz Ladore oud. If you've smelled some of the real proper oud fragrances, if you're buying this for an oud fragrance, you will be let down. However, however, um, understand that oud is a very vital part of this creation. Because remember, this is Rhonda Hamami doing proper Arabic style perfumery. She's a Syrian perfumer, by the way. One of the few women Syrian perfumers out there. She hasn't done much, uh, but this is by far, by far, the best fragrance she's ever made. By far. This is her masterpiece. She did a couple other things I've never smelled. She did some stuff from for Guerlain, Mon Presso Nectar, I've never smelled. L'Enstant Magic, I've never smelled. Cruel Gardenia, I've never smelled. Um, so she's done some other things. I'm just uh, not very familiar with any of the other stuff that she did. She did some stuff for Van Cleef and Arpels for the uh, Extraordinary Collection. Uh, Orchidy Vani, I've never smelled it. But uh, this is her masterpiece for me, hands down. Uh, the, the best thing she's, she's ever created. And, but she's a Syrian perfumer at heart. Um, and so using oud in these type of Middle Eastern notes probably comes very natural to her. And the oud here is perfect. It's absolutely perfectly dosed. It gives you a little bit of that animalic oud, blends beautifully with the frankincense and the myrrh to create this frankincense, myrrh, oud, leather, Middle Eastern style combination. And so to me, the oud in this actually smells higher quality than I would say, you know, some of the modern oud notes that I've smelled in some of the newer amouages. I actually just reviewed Amouage King, King Blue. Um, you can go check out my review of that. There seem to be some people who are a little offended. I wasn't nicer to that fragrance. I will tell you, I will take this all day, twice on Sunday over King Blue. For me, this is much more my speed, much more my style. Um, and the oud in here, I think, is higher quality. Now, that may be incorrect. There may actually be, you could say, hey, this is the oud we're using in these newer ones, and it actually is more expensive. I'm just telling you, from my personal taste, I would take the way that they executed the oud in, um, in Epic Man. And um, so the bit that sort of pushes it into that Hall of Fame status, if you will, is the base, is that animalic leather. If you know my taste, for vintage fragrances, Leonard Porom, Antaeus, Bellamy, those are Hall of Fame fragrances for me. And the base of Epic Man with that castorium leather combination where, I mean, you could almost say that this feels like a vintage fragrance done in an Arabic style. I mean, that's literally what it, what it feels like to me. Um, and as a leather lover of perfume, again, I don't rate fragrances, but if I did, this would be 10. This would be a pure 10 out of 10 for me. Um, absolute perfection. I don't, again, I don't give ratings, but if I did, I, I could not give this anything less than a 10. Um, now, the other thing I should mention is how some of these notes sort of um, tag team. So let's say I mentioned a little bit, this little hint of cumin in the top, right? The cumin in the top sort of um, works in tandem with the castorium in the base to always give your nose something that is slightly, um, not off, but almost like it's slightly animalic all throughout the stages, right? So there's never really a time in this fragrance where you're not smelling it and just getting a little tickle, 
uh, you know, just a little twang, a little, a little, you know, mark, uh, just a little, you know, just something there to, to remind you that you're smelling a fragrance that has some balls. You know, this is, uh, this is not a meek fragrance. This is not a fragrance that is, um, you know, you, when you wear this, you, you will, uh, probably, you, you're going to, let's say, attract attention wearing Epic Man. Let's just put it that way. And so the fragrance never really has a point where it just sort of turn, turns soft and meek. There's always a touch of that animalic going, whether it's the oud in the base, whether it's the castorium, whether it's the cumin in the top. Um, there's just always a little something all throughout the, the life of the fragrance. And they play off of each other beautifully. It also feels extremely high quality. And I've smelled some damn good castorium notes in my life. Uh, I've smelled some fragrances that use real castorium. Uh, and, I mean, this smells like some very high, high quality castorium. Amouage was using very high quality castorium. Also, if you ever smelled Imitation Man, that's another one with a beautiful castorium note. So you, you get the idea now, this sort of uh, oriental where the perfumer put all of these thoughts, you know, these different layers, different um, notes working in tandem. And the other one is the geranium, which most people don't talk about the geranium at all. I will tell you that the geranium sort of adds this hint of a rosy flower in here. Remember, it's not a rose oud though. It's a little bit of a rosy flower touch in a, in a um, the geranium in here can also feel a little bit green, um, but green rosy. Okay, but it's nowhere near the usual rose oud combo, rose oud saffron combo that you're thinking of. Absolutely nothing like that. It just adds a little bit of this uh, floral touch. It's nowhere near the star of the show, though. It's more like a secondary note to keep everything propped up. Now, the other notes that work in tandem, and I hinted at it earlier, is the myrrh and the saffron. And so those two notes sort of work in, 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 ta in tandem to give it this sort of resinous like quality. So you have the cumin and the animalics in the base, you have the saffron in the top and the myrrh in the mid working together, and then imagine all of the notes just let let go, right? They they teamed up to to give you this fragrance as the hours started to tick by when the perfume when the uh, magician sort of throws that potion into the into the fire, they all fly off in their own direction and um you know up into the sky up into the desert sky that's the image of epic man to me that's what i see when i wear this and it is an image that is clear as day it is absolutely clear it's a it's a brilliant creation i want to read you what amwaj has to say about it just to give you a little bit of blurb but um this is one that i would urge uh any, let's say, newcomer to either niche perfumery or Arabic style perfumery to smell. This is definitely one of the, if you said, Ramsey, pick five amouages I should smell on the masculine side, this would absolutely be one of those five. So the title that, that uh, amouage chose to go with here is a duel of spices and intense woods. A blazing thrust of pink pepper and nutmeg, studs, and an aromatic and camphoraceous bouquet of myrtle and cardamom, colored by a suave touch of saffron, cumin, and the citrusy tang of mace, while a geranium bursting with floral greenness continues the clean and sparkly opening. I don't know if I agree with that. This opening is not clean and sparkly. Um, the honeyed bittersweet myrrh, I agree with that, pre preludes the dark and sonorous complexity of the woody base. Yes, absolutely. The base is woody, but to me it's more animalic leathery. But there's definitely that woody base. Yes, the sandalwood in the base for sure. Um, the animalic intensity of musk and castorium. There is a little bit of musk as well and patchouli in the base. Uh, responds to that of a barely tanned leather. Camel leather. Between luminous strands of cedar wood and frankincense, sandalwood whispers its milky sweetness before being eclipsed by a splendid and masterful, imposing and tenebrous and imperial oud. A journey through light and darkness, Epic Man is a deep, woody composition evoking the might of the omniscient spirit of nature. So Rhonda Hamami, a little bit about her. One of the few 
If not only female Syrian perfumers, Rhonda Hamami used her Levantine heritage to create a warm, comforting, and resolutely sensual style where crackling spices often caress lush floral hearts. So that's the little write-up by Amouage. Uh, one thing that I have to say is I've never smelled the new bottle with the epic written right here. I've heard some people report back to me that it's horrendous. And usually what I tell them is try to get some air into the bottle. You know, if you get a new bottle and it's really bad, uh, like they're saying it disappears in two hours, which I don't know if I believe that, but put some air into it. Give it a good 10 sprays. I mean, sp spray yourself 10, 20 times and then put it away for three or, or four months and then come back to it. Because sometimes once some air gets into the bottle, it will change a little bit. Um, but man, I'll tell you what. Uh, if it if it takes an extra hundred bucks or whatever you have to pay to hunt down a vintage bottle, if the new ones are that bad, I'm telling you it's worth every penny. This is one of the absolute gems from the House of Amouage. I know I've been very hard on the House of Amouage in my recent videos, and to be quite fair, I think they deserve it. Um, for a house like Amouage, who really was a house that prided themselves on standing on their own two feet and doing their own thing, even if it meant going against the grain and having someone like Christopher Chong, who at the helm was willing to sort of take those risks and chances and to turn into what they've turned into. Um, I don't know how they would expect their, um, you know, their fans to react. Uh, if their fans aren't reacting the way that I am, they're probably not real fans or they're newer fans to Amwaj because for me, and this is something I said on a previous Amwaj video, they lost my trust is what ended up happening. With all these releases, Meander, Boundless, you know, all of these releases that have come out that have been a little bit head scratchers um, and then now King Blue. So what the path that they're going on, um, you know, I... Um, I... I'm a little sad to be inside it, it as a Amouage lover. It's like a stab to the heart, you know, because they're creating fragrances. While it's not necessarily a bad fragrance, King Blue or Boundless or whatever one you want to point to since Chong left, they don't feel like a proper Amouage to me. Um, Silver Oud does. Silver Oud is probably the one from the Fishman's creations that I do think feels like a proper Amouage. But even that now, King Blue feels like an iteration of Silver Oud. Um, so I, for me, this is Amouage. This is what, this is a perfect example of what Amouage stands for. And they did it in a masculine. And if you've never smelled Epic Woman, just FYI, I will tell you, if you've never smelled Epic Woman, um, whether you're a man or a woman or, you know, anyone can wear both of these, I would say. But I think most men wouldn't even give it a chance because it's Epic Woman. Try Epic Woman. It is amazing. Um, both the whole the set of, of Epic is amazing. Maybe I'll review that one day soon as well. But um, this is what Amouage is to me. This is what they. This is what Amouage stands for. Um, and these are the Amouages that I will always appreciate and respect. And I'm so I I feel. Almost like a weight off of my shoulder doing this review because this is uh, necessary. And there's many fragrances in my collection that I, I want to do these type of full reviews on where I really talk about the fragrance in detail. Um, and, you know, but I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. But uh, this one, it just, it was calling my name. You know how sometimes you just look at your cabinet and a perfume just calls out to you. And, and it was Epic's turn. Uh, and I'm and I'm very very happy that I got a chance to review this and talk about this and put my thoughts out there. I hope I hope and pray and keep my fingers crossed that Amouage will get back to doing perfumery on this scale. This is a triumph of perfumery for me, and it absolutely just shadows. I mean, Epic is up here looking down on all of the recent Amouage creations. Uh, this is on the Mount Rushmore of Amouage for me. And um, I hope you guys get to try it. If you've smelled Epic, do let me know what you think of it. Let me know what your favorite parts of the fragrance are. Let me know what you think of the path of Amouage and, and how they're going, what's going on with them. Uh, I love seeing your faces in the comments. We are still small enough where I can respond to every single comment. So I very much appreciate you watching. Thank you for watching my Epic Man review. Do leave a comment. Cheers, guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.